supercharge your productivity with Ember. And for the most part, what this is, is an intro to Ember talk that's aimed at people that know something about server-side MVC technologies. And the reason I think it's good to present it this way is that Ember is an MVC framework. Something like Rails is an MVC framework. .NET is MVC. But when you're on the client side, as opposed to on the server side, some of the terminology means different things. And if you come into it knowing about server-side MVC and aren't prepared for some of these differences, it can get very confusing when you're dealing with words that you think you know what they mean, but they actually mean something completely different because you're in a different context. And so my goal with this is to hopefully give you some of that context so that you'll know which things are different and why they are different. Uh, so a bit about me. My name is Jeremy Green. I'm a software consultant. Uh, Octo Labs is my company. You can find me on Twitter at Jag the Drummer or send me an email. Um, some things I enjoy are <laughs> dopamine and serotonin. And technically, these are the only two things that you enjoy. So we have that in common. <laughs> um, at a higher level of, of abstraction, some things that I'm interested in are drumming, photography, and homebrewing. So if you want to talk about any of those things, just come find me. Uh, this is a project that I've done with Ember recently uh, that is open source. So if you want to check out a uh, reasonably real world Ember app, uh, watch.canary.io is where you can find it. Um, and also on that URL, you'll find a link to the source code where it lives on GitHub. Um, and it is basically just a uh, data visualization project that takes data that's produced by Canary.io which is a project that Michael Gorsuch over here uh, has started as a high frequency monitoring solution for DevOps type people. All right, so there's two main talks to this, or two main parts to this talk. First part is comparing and contrasting Rails with Ember. The second part is a step through of building a small app so that you can see how some of these pieces start to fit together. So the first thing that I think is important to do is to really set the stage and understand why you would use Ember. And Ember is really, really shines at being a single page application framework. It's for the times when you want to build an app that's going to live entirely in the browser and you're you know, trying to avoid page refreshes, that kind of thing. It is not for building games. Uh, you know, it's, it's really for line of business type applications where you're going to be showing and retrieving data. You know, a lot of CRUD type stuff. Um, standard business apps, really. Um, and so one of the things that comes into play here is where does the face of your web app live? And by that, what I really mean is where is it generated? And the old school way is on the server, we generate a giant string of HTML using whatever method we do that, deliver that over the wire to the browser. The browser just renders that document as it came down. And then we apply just a sprinkling of JavaScript to do little fancy things here and there. And if we need extra data, we maybe pull something in via AJAX and then replace little bits of the DOM here and there. With a single page app, you do things completely differently. You want to deliver empty application assets to the browser let the browser assemble the DOM itself using all of your assets, and then you're pushing and pulling data via JSON. So if you've ever worked in an SPA of any sort, you know that there are a lot of challenges that come up. And the reason that you would use a framework like Ember is you don't want to have to overcome these challenges on your own. You want to just use something that somebody else has already figured out how to get over all of these hurdles. So some of the challenges that you might face is, first of all, you kind of have to rebuild the A tag. You're going to want to allow people to click on something within your app, take away whatever they're looking at currently, and replace that with something else. You know, that's normally handled by the browser for you with just a regular A tag. It follows the navigation, and you're done. But if you're trying to avoid page reloads, you can't have that happen, so you need a solution. Um, you're going to have to deal with retrieving and displaying data. You're going to have to deal with user interactions. 
uh, data binding. If somebody changes a value in one part of your app, how does that flow through to the other parts of your app? Uh, manipulating the URL. This is a big one that can be a real pain in the butt. But at some point, once you've got this single page application running, somebody's going to say, OK, great. Now I'm you know, three or four screens down into the app, and I want to be able to share this URL on Facebook so that other people can land here and see what I'm seeing. And if you're not manipulating the URL as people step through your application, you don't have a good way to do that. Um, and then you're going to start diving into the push state URL, or sorry, push state API for browsers, and that gets to be no fun real quick. Um, and closely related to that is the setting up of initial state. When somebody does link in somewhere deep within your app, how does your app know which code to fire in order to set up that initial view? So Ember comes to the rescue for all of these things. Um, and I kind of like this graphic for this because I think of Ember as being the big elephant on the bottom that is carrying your application on top of it. It frees you from doing a lot of grunt work that you would have to do otherwise. So it strives to solve all of these problems in a very opinionated way. And understanding these opinions is very helpful to understanding how it does it and why it does it those ways. So I think of Ember as an MVC-ish framework. The reason is it's different than server-side. And like I mentioned before, many of the same terms, but they mean different things. So you've got your standard model view and controller. But then there are some other parts that aren't represented in the classic MVC acronym. You've got something called the router. You've got routes. And you've got templates. So first, let's just look at where Ember is very similar to Rails. And there are a lot of parts that are very similar. So if you know Rails or .NET MVC, or I'm sure there are probably some PHP MVC frameworks that are going to be very similar. So the first place that they're very similar is the router. Rails or Ember has something just called the router. And Rails has config routes.rb. And this is just a little piece of code that is responsible for mapping URLs to executable parts of your application. It takes a URL and figures out, OK, what's the code path that we need to execute in order to show what is expected to be seen at this URL? So in Rails, you're going to have, you know, for a very, very simple application, you might have a route or config routes that looks like this. It's saying that whenever somebody tries to get about, that that should be routed to a static pages controller with an about action. And so in Ember, you've got something very, very similar to that. You've got the app router. And then inside of it, you're going to say this.route the about route. And so it does a lot of uh, naming. A, a lot of the magic happens by naming things consistently and predictably. And so just by saying that you want to route the about route, it's going to assume that you've got a template just called about. If you need a controller or a route, uh, it's going to assume that they are also just called about. Uh, so it does a lot of mapping and hooking up of things just as long as you follow reasonably sane naming conventions. So another place where Ember and Rails are very similar is in the model area. In both cases, what a model is is just an object wrapper for your business data. So in Rails, you're going to have a DB schema, which is where you're actually listing out you know, what attributes are in your model. Uh, Rails does some guessing of how to set up your model based on what's in schema DB. And then you're going to have your, your model class itself, which is going to inherit from Active Record Base. Um, on that, you may have what are called virtual attributes, such as the name in this case. And that's basically taking several other attributes that live on the model, wrapping them up, and making a, a bigger virtual attribute. So in Ember, you're going to have something pretty similar. The, Biggest difference here is that in Ember, you don't have DB schema 
that is listing the, the attributes that go on your models. So you have to declare them on the model itself. So in this case, we've got a pattern model. We're telling it that it's got three attributes called P1, P2, and P3, that each one of those are expected to be numbers when they come down across the wire. And then we've got a virtual attribute called name that does basically the same thing as what our Rails example did. Uh, one thing to notice here is that the property part of this is saying that the name property depends on the values of P1, P2, and P3. So anytime one of those other attributes is updated, the name is going to be recalculated and redisplayed if one of those changes. So places that Ember is not equal to Rails and where it's very easy to run into confusion. The biggest one is around views and templates. And a lot of this is due to the fact that in Rails, when you talk about a view or a template, you're really talking about the same thing. Your templates live in a folder called views. And so it's easy to talk about, go edit the about view or edit the about template. And you're really talking about editing the same file. In Ember, views and templates are different things. A view is one piece of code, and a template is a different piece of code. So it's important to understand that, that those terms aren't interchangeable in the Ember world like they are in the Rails world. So luckily, an Ember template is very analogous to a Rails template. It is the raw markup that the user is going to see that gets rendered by the browser. Divs, H1s, P tags, all of that kind of stuff. An Ember view is really a lot closer to the JS sprinkles that you might sprinkle into a, a Rails app. It's little bits of fine-grained user interaction, uh, little details that you need to deal with. Um, and another caveat here is that Ember has something called components which are based on the uh, upcoming web components standard that's being standardized currently. And views and components are very similar. They both deal with interaction and DOM logic and manipulating the DOM directly. And it, they're, it's really the only place within an Ember app that you're going to do any sort of direct DOM manipulation. Um, otherwise, you let Ember do all of that stuff for you. Um, in a component or a view is the place that you're going to have jQuery DOM selectors. And it's probably where you're going to integrate with other JS libs, especially if they're visually oriented. Like That's where you're going to have a D3 integration or something else that renders a fancy view of your data. Um, where views and components are different, components are very isolated. They don't have any greater application context. They only know about data that you pass in directly to them on purpose. Um, this is very good. This helps keep keeps things isolated, make sure that your components are very small and reusable across other parts of your application, because you know that they aren't leaking references or having references leaked to them from other parts of your application. Views, on the other hand, are not isolated, and they have application context. They know about the controller that is rendering them. And so it's possible for a view to reach back up into the application and do things possibly in an, un in an unexpected way. And so using views, it's a lot easier to make things that aren't as well isolated and if you try to reuse a view in another part of your application, if you haven't been very careful about it, it's possible to have unexpected side effects as you try to reuse this stuff. So if possible, use components instead of views. So another place where Ember and Rails are very different is the question, what is a route? And in Rails, almost any line inside of config routes is usually referred to as a route. Each individual line of code in that file is often called a route. But in Ember, that is not the case. In Ember, when you say this dot route about, that's just a line in the router. That is not the route itself. There's a whole other freestanding piece of code 
that is called the about route. And so understanding that difference is one that you're going to want to come to come to grips with pretty early in your learning about Ember. So the difference being that in Rails, a route is in the router. It is part of the router. And in Ember, the route is something that happens after the router. And so what I mean by that is what happens after URL mapping. And in Rails, as soon as the URL is mapped, it gets sent off to a, an action within a controller. right? That's where you're going to pull something out of the database, do data setup for the thing that you're about to render to show the user. Excuse me. And in Ember, a route is what happens after the router. The router does its thing, figures out what's about to be executed, and then passes off and executes the route. So in this case, after the line in the Ember router for this dot route about is executed, it fires up the about route. The about route renders or has a, a callback in it called model that is responsible for returning whatever data is being modeled by the current interaction uh, or is going to be represented by the, the template. So what, an Ember route is equal to a Rails controller? Is, is that what I'm saying? Not exactly. A route in Ember is analogous to pretty much any Git action on a controller. These are things that are setting up the data for user interaction, but aren't actually changing anything. So then where does that leave us with the other Rails actions. You've got your get or your posts and puts and deletes where you're actually changing data. And those are analogous to controllers within Ember. So an Ember controller is analogous to post put delete controller actions that are actually changing data based on something that the user has done. So an Ember controller is going to look something like this. Um, we've got a patterns new controller that has a hash of actions that can be taken on it. And like if you're going to save a pattern, you're going to look up a model, call the save on it, and then transition to somewhere else within your application. And so that would be, in a, in a Rails context, that would be analogous to, you know, put these attributes into the model, save it, and then redirect to showing that model instead of editing it. So for the wrap up of part one, those are all the big differences and places that you can stumble coming from Rails into Ember. So the things to keep in mind is that Ember is opinionated. It has very clear opinions on how you should do things and where things should go within your application. Um, you're way better off if you don't try to fight that and just try to learn more about what Ember wants to do and the way that it wants you to do things. Um, much like Rails, you know, it, it, going down the happy path is a lot easier. A lot easier than trying to forge your own. That's going to be, oftentimes, what you're trying to do. It, they're going to have a solution for it within the framework, and it's just a matter of learning about how that, that problem has been overcome by the framework. So as you're learning or trying to teach somebody that's coming from Rails or another server-side MVC framework into Ember, as we've just talked about, these are all kind of the handy comparisons that you want to keep in mind to just kind of help yourself remember where code is supposed to go. Um, and also, as you're trying to learn this, it's always helpful, and with any technology, it's really helpful to keep in mind when are the appropriate times to use this and when are inappropriate times to use this. And if you find yourself trying to fight the framework a lot, that may be a good sign that you're trying to use it in an application that it's really not a good fit for and that maybe you want to look at something else. So for part two, uh, I have a very simple application called Pattern Lab that we're just going to start stepping through, building it up from nothing. 
um, and see how it, all of this stuff fits together. So here's an animated GIF that shows the general use case that we're going for. You've got a list of patterns that you can switch between. You can check out an About page. You can add new patterns. Um, and also, there's a JS bin where you, act, you can actually see a live uh, version of this. Uh, uh, and at the end of this, I've got a link that's going to link you to these slides and all of the JS bins that we're about to look at. So the plan for part two is state a goal that we want to accomplish with this app. Look at the way that you might do it in Rails. If there is an easy analogous method, then we're going to look at the Ember way. And then we're going to rinse and repeat, do that again and again. So let's get started. So getting started, we're going to look at just a stupidly simple app. Like so simple that it would really be ridiculous to use either Rails or Ember for this. We're talking about static web page type stuff. So for Rails, in a very, very simple app, you might have a route, uh, config routes that looks like this. You're just routing the root. URL to some page that you want to render. And then that page is going to have nothing but a little bit of HTML on it that's telling you how useless this app is. Um, behind the scenes, you're going to have a controller that doesn't even have to have any actions implemented in it because you're not actually trying to do anything. Um, and just like Rails will kind of skip that you don't have that action in place because you don't need it. Ember does a lot of the same kind of things. You only need to implement the parts of it that you actually need. And if there are parts of the stack that you don't need, you can just leave it out. And Ember will take care of generating that for you. So in Ember, an analogous app is this. You just create a, a variable called app that is an Ember application dot create. Uh, and then you have a template that uh, just gets rendered. Um, so things to note here about the template, um, you would just include this directly in your, say, index.html. Uh, and it's, it is inside of a script tag, but then the type is text x handlebars. And so that tells Ember that this is going to be a template that is going to need to be rendered due to changes that may happen in the app. Um, most times, whenever you have something like this, uh, a template tag, you're going to have an ID or a name on there that identifies which template this is. In this case, there is no name or ID. So Ember is going to assume that that is the root template for the main index page of the app. Does that make sense? So then when you render, you know, if, if you plug this into a web page um, and run it, that's what you're going to get, just a, a basic web page that looks like a static site. So there's a lot of Ember magic happening at work here. Uh, and this is what I was alluding to earlier, where you only need to write the parts that you need. Ember will auto-generate any parts of the stack that you don't write. If you wanted to be very explicit about it, that app that we were just looking at, you, you could do this. You could tell it explicitly to route the index um, whenever there's no additional path given. That line in the router happens for you automatically if you don't add it. Uh, the index route itself, you could extend Ember route emptily and just create the index route yourself. but. You don't need to do that. Same thing with the index controller. You can create an empty controller that doesn't do anything. But since it doesn't do anything, you don't need it. And you can just let Ember do that for you. Uh, same thing with the view. So all of that really sucks. You don't want to write all of that stuff that you don't need. It just makes your code base harder to comprehend and puts a lot of stuff in there that is adding to your cognitive overhead. But it's not delivering anything good to your app. So if you don't need it, don't write it. All right, so the next bit is uh, the application layout. And what I'm talking about there is all the wrapper parts of your page, you know, headers and footers, and things that you're going to expect to be consistent from page to page as you move within your app. 
but that you don't want to have to include on every page or in every template that you write. Um, so in Rails, uh, you've got your app views layouts uh, directory where you're going to have an application.html.erb, which is your main uh, layout. That's where you're going to you know, have your head, where you include all your JavaScripts and CSS. And then you've got the, the yield block here, which says main content goes here. You can have your headers and footers above it, but yield is what tells Rails where to insert, like say, your home page template. Uh, in Ember, this is very, very similar. Uh, in, your, in your main application uh, template, you, know, you can have your header class where you set up your header. And then this outlet block right here is analogous to the yield statement that we saw in Rails. It says this is where sub-content goes. And so if you have that in a JS bin and run it, then you end up with something like this. You can see the header bar added up there to the page that we saw just a minute ago. So the next bit is adding a page. Uh, in Rails, again, you'd open up config routes, add a route, you'd add a new template, and then at somewhere in your application, you're going to link to that new route so that you can see it. In Ember, this is very similar again. You're going to open up your router file, add a new line that says route, and then add a new template to the page. And then somewhere, like in your application layout, you're going to add a link. Um, the link to helper there is provided by Ember. And it's basically the reinvention of the A tag that I was talking about earlier. This is what handles getting you from one part of the app to the other, tearing down whatever view you're looking at, rendering the, the new view, and replacing it in the DOM. So once you do that, then you end up with an app that looks like this. It gives you an extra page that you can click on the About link and takes you there. Uh, so already, you can start to see that you can start to do some prototyping and building up of a single page app with very little code. Uh, there's not a lot of code that you have to write. Ember's doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes to bring your single page app to life. Um, so the next bit, rendering partials, because you don't always want to cram everything into one giant template. Uh, in Rails, it's pretty easy. You use the render helper, give it the path to the partial that you want to render, and then you have a partial that has some content. Um, in Ember, it's very similar, but there's a partial, or there's a helper just called partial. But again, you just tell it what's the partial you want to use, tell it the name, and then in partials, much like in Rails, uh, the ID has to start with an underscore. Um, and this is, I think, again, just to help you be able to quickly identify when you're looking at any given template. Is this a, a top level template that's a main part of the app, or is this a partial that is reused? So then once you've included the footer partial and rendered it, you get the H or the horizontal line down there at the bottom of the copyright notice. So all this has been all right so far, but it's all very static. We're not doing anything very interesting. And the point of this is you want to be able to display dynamic data that you're getting in from other sources. Um, and so in Rails, a very simple about route, you know, maybe you're wanting to show the version number of your app. And so in the, in the action for your about page, you just set up a variable that has a string that represents your version number. And then in your template, you'd render the about data version. So in Ember, this is where you start getting into implementing a route. And so in our index route, we're going to say that the model that we return, which is going to be displayed by our template, is just a hash that has one key value pair. The key is called version, and the value is whatever our current version number is. Then in the template for the index, uh, you can just refer directly to the attribute or the property of the model that was returned. So here we just have double curlies and version. 
And so that's going to output 0 0.0.1 uh, right up there. So another thing that Ember does for you is data binding. And like I mentioned earlier, this is uh, concerned with if you change data in one part of your application, how does that flow to other parts of your application? And do you have to you know, register listeners for key up or key down or focus lost or whatever? Um, and with Ember, this is very easy. So here in this template, we've, we're using version twice. One, we have it inside of this p tag so that we can just display the version. And then on the next line down, we're using the value of version in an input. And so when you render this, that's going to give you something like this, where you've got the, the p tag here, and then the text area or the text input directly underneath it. And you can see anytime that text input changes, the value rendered in the paragraph tag right above it changes as well. So as soon as you start typing in that input area, anywhere else that the value that's represented by that input is used within your application, it immediately sees the change too. And so this is very helpful. That keeps you from having to set up just a lot of boilerplate code about listen for this change on screen and then push it through and let it filter through the application. Ember just does that for you. All right, so now we're really starting to get to where we could do something useful, models. We really don't want to be hard coding static data that we're acting like is dynamic data. You really want to be pulling live data from somewhere else. So in Rails, like we saw earlier, you're going to have your DB schema and then an active record object that represents that data. Um, then you're going to have a controller that, say for the patterns index, is going to pull all patterns in the system, show those to you. And then you're going to have your template that loops over all of the patterns and displays them. And in Ember, this is going to be very similar. We've got the same model object that we saw earlier. Uh, in the router, you're going to add this.resource patterns. And that tells the router that you're going to be dealing with live data objects instead of just a kind of dumb flat screen like for the about page. And so then in the, the patterns route, this is kind of a, a dumbed down, very simple but brute force method of doing it. For the model hook, we're just going to return an array that contains one freshly created pattern. And then in the uh, template, we're going to loop over that array that currently contains one object uh, and show the one object that's in there. So then you're going to end up with an app that looks like this. When you go to the uh, patterns page, you're going to see that one pattern that we're creating right there. In so that's not really all that useful still because we're still kind of hard coding stuff. Um, Ember comes with something called the fixture adapter, which is a really cool little bit of technology that allows you to start writing things as if you've already hooked up your app to a live API, but without actually having to hook it up to a live API. So this is really, really useful if you want to start doing some early prototyping of what's our, gonna app, what's our app going to look like and how are we going to deal with data even before you actually have an API that will handle that data. So this lets you do really a full-fledged prototype of your app without any of the questions about how do we deal with the data store, how do we make it available, any of that stuff. So this lets you get started really quick. Uh, so to do that, you're going to tell Ember that uh, your application adapter is the fixture adapter. And then for, this is assuming that you've already set up the model called pattern. And then you say app pattern .reopen class, and then hand it a fixtures object. And the fixtures object is just an array of predefined data that you want your app to act like these objects already exist in the system. And so then in the patterns route, the model hook gets a lot simpler. We're just saying return all of the patterns that we can find in the data store. 
And so then when you do that, when you go to the patterns route, you get something like this. It's looking up all of these hashes that are in the fixtures object, turning those in, like hydrating uh, pattern models with that data, setting them up in an array, and then handing that to the, the template to be rendered. So that's pretty handy. Um, so the next bit is dynamic routes uh, and nested routes. Um, in Ember, any time that you start nesting routes within one another, that's, you're usually going to do that because you want to show, um, like for instance, you want to show the pattern itself within the context of the greater patterns screen. So like on the original demo, you know, we've got the patterns all listed down the left side. You click one of those, and on the right side, you're seeing the new pattern now. So the, the nesting of routes should very closely, if not exactly, match nesting of templates that you want to have happening within your app. Um, so on this, uh, on this new line here, the this.resource pattern singular, we're saying that the path to get to that is going to be, is going to include a pattern ID. And the, the colon right here in front of that path segment is what tells Ember that this is a dynamic segment of the path. So by default, what Ember is going to do there is it's going to take that pattern ID and try to look in the store and say, do I have a pattern with this pattern ID? Um, so another, another one of the things that's got an intelligent default for that, because that's the way most people use it. That's the sane way to use it. Um, so if you're doing things the sane way, you can just kind of let Ember do its thing for you. So let's see. This is the, so this is the template for the patterns index itself, where, you're, where we're looping over each of the patterns generating an LI that links to the pattern, and then another outlet. And so inside of any template, if you're going to nest additional content, you just add another outlet. And controllers and routes that you've set up to be nested in your router, they will be progressively rendered inside of whatever parent template is in place for them. I hope that makes sense. I don't think I said that as clearly as I could have. So then what this looks like is you're looking at the list of patterns. You click on one, and you can see the, the display part down there changes. We're just showing the different name as you click from part to part. So the next bit is what we've been looking at is kind of boring. Just having some numbers on there isn't a great representation of those patterns. We want to show something a little more graphically interesting. And so this is where we're going to dive into a component. Uh, in order to display a pattern within a template, we want to be able to just display it with something as simple as this. Uh, this first bit is saying that we're calling a component called pattern display. We're passing in a parameter called pattern. And the value of that parameter is the current model. Um, and then we're telling it explicitly what's the width and the height that we want to render at. The template for the pattern display is pretty simple. So here we're saying the ID of this template is called components slash pattern display. Matches this over here. So it, Ember knows that this is the template we want to render. And then we're just rendering a canvas that has a few attributes bound to it, um, the width and the height and a canvas ID. So within our pattern display component, uh, I'm using an uh, outside library called Chromanon. And this is just basically a procedural texture generator where you hand it a few numbers, and it generates some nice looking textures. Um, all all of this stuff that you're seeing here on the, on the screen is just part of what you've got to do to get Chromanon to do its thing. It's not really interesting in terms of the Ember stuff. But what is interesting is, so we have the pattern display component, which inherits from Ember component. 
And then we've created a, a method just called draw pattern where we're doing all of whatever we need to do to make this thing render. Um, also within that, that pattern display component, there's a hook called did insert element. And this is fired right after Ember has put the template into the DOM. So there's a lot of things that you where you can't really effectively render your template or show your data until the the div that you're going to operate on is already a part of the DOM. And so what this is the did insert element fires right after that template's been added and is live and is available to be worked with. So what we're doing here is saying as soon as this div has been inserted into the DOM, we want to draw our pattern into it. Um, automatic update is not a normal uh, Ember callback. It's just something that, it's a function that I needed, and I called it automatic update to make it clear as to what it does. So all it's doing is pretty much drawing the pattern. But this observes here is saying that anytime pattern changes or pattern.p1 or pattern p2 or pattern p3 changes, fire this function. So what that's saying is anytime any of these things change that affect what the pattern looks like, let's just go ahead and redraw. Um, and then canvas ID is just there to make it convenient to have multiple patterns on the same page. So once we've done this, then we get something like this where we can link we can actually show a preview of what each pattern looks like, and we can link from one to the other, showing a, a larger version of it as we go. Uh, so next thing, we want to be able to create a new pattern. Um, so to be able to do that, we're going to add another line to the route, this.route.new. Uh, notice this is inside of our patterns route. So this is patterns slash new. Uh, we're going to link to it. And then our, our new template just basically has three inputs, one for P1, one for P2, one for P3, uh, and two buttons. One that allows you to randomize those values, and then one that allows you to save the pattern. And then we're also, just for convenience, showing you the pattern as you're creating it. Uh, the new route. For its model hook, the model being represented in the template is just a new pattern. So to do that, we're going to say this.store.createRecord and create a pattern record. And so then in the pattern's new controller, we're going to have two different actions, one for save pattern. Uh, at this point, we don't even really need to call save on a model yet because we're not persisting data anywhere. Uh, so at this point, we can just say, let's transition to the pattern itself so that we're showing the pattern instead of looking at the form for the pattern. Uh, and then the randomize function just sets a random value on P1, 2, and 3 of the current pattern. So then what that looks like is this. You've got your list of patterns. We can add a button up there for new pattern. When you click on that, it's going to give you the form. You can randomize and then save it, and it's in the new list. Uh, so again, and all of this is happening purely inside the browser. We haven't had to hook it up to a live API URL yet, uh, but we're able to do everything and act like we're dealing with real data, get a full, fully functional prototype that you know is very, very close to what you might have in your final app. So then the last bit is, let's hook this up to a real API. Let's assume that we have an API on the back end that will take pattern data from a post, save that into a database, and then add that to the list of patterns when you go to, to uh, list them. To make this change, it's very simple. At this point, we're going to tell it that our application adapter is the REST adapter, and we want to extend the REST adapter by telling it what host we want to look at. Um, and I've, I've built a very simple Rails API that lives at this address that just has a, your standard REST actions for patterns. You can list them on the index. You can create a new one. 
you can update one, you can delete one. So, so this part really is all that we need to do to start pulling data from that URL. Um, the only other change that we need to make is at this point our save pattern function needs to be updated because we actually need to call save to tell Ember, hey, we want to persist this data and not just keep it in the browser. Um, so at this point, we're just saying, let's get our current model, call save on it. Save returns a promise. Uh, and you're telling, and then with the then function, you're telling it when this promise resolves, uh, let's just transition to the pattern itself and show it. Uh, you can also have a, a reject handler there. So if saving it doesn't work for some reason, you've got the option of directing to an error screen. Maybe you just add an error message to the form that they're looking at, uh, whatever you want to do. Um, and so that's it. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, this URL right here, octolabs.com slash thunderplanes2014. You can find a link to all of these slides, uh, links to all of the JS bins that were listed during the uh, presentation. And there's also a link to the GitHub repo for the Rails API that was listed at that Heroku address and also links to a GitHub URL for um, basically a, exactly the same Pattern Lab app, but implemented within Ember CLI instead of as one full page JS bin. So that's it. Anybody have any questions? So when you have an outlet to display, display some template, you have multiple of those on the page, you can. Uh, so the question is, when you have outlets and you're trying to display sub information, can you have multiple outlets on an, on one page, and can you name them? And the answer is yes. You can have as many outlets as you want. Each one can have a name, and then uh, within, at, I, I believe it happens at the view layer. May may also happen at the controller layer, but you can tell it where to. Say you've got an outlet named sidebar. You can say render into sidebar to tell it which parts of the application to fill out. Anybody else? OK, the other one is that when you build out your Rails API, is it just doing standard put and post to get whatever it gets that API when you do data source save? Yep. Yeah, so the question is uh, for the Rails API portion of that, is it just doing standard REST, get post put against? the endpoint? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, it, I should have mentioned that all of these examples for the data part are using Ember Data, which is kind of an add-on library to Ember itself. But it's, it's maintained by the same Ember core team. Um, and it is, it's by default works very well with Rails stuff. It expects RESTful resources. Um, just by calling save on that new object, it was going to do a what a post to create the new one. And then when you're editing an object and you hit save on an existing object, it's going to do a put. Um, so it, it knows how to do all of the things you expect by default. Before you linked it up to that REST API, uh, was that using local storage, or was it saving on the current page load? So if you refresh the browser, <coughs> would it go away? Yeah, so the question is, before hooking up to the API, what was actually happening with that data? Is it going into the local storage, or is it just resident in memory? And the answer is it's just resident in memory. So when you hit reload, you would always have those three uh, patterns that we define in the fixtures. You could add five or 10 new ones. And then when you hit reload, you're going to be back to looking at the three that are defined in the fixtures. There is a local storage adapter so that you can continue to work with data and objects exactly the same way, but instead of going over the rest, going through the rest adapter and going over the wire, it goes through the local storage adapter, gets saved into your local store, and then when you hit reload, you're going to have your, your data saved there. OK, the question is, how would I, descri how would I describe the learning curve for Ember? Um, I would say it's steep-ish, but getting less steep all the time. The, uh, the documents on emberjs.com are all really, really very good. 
Um, I re really recommend starting with the, I forget if it's intro or getting started section, but they have a section that kind of is like this where it's stepping through putting together a simple application. Uh, they cover most of the main use cases, a lot of the weird edge cases that you might run into, and then all of the extensive documentation um, is really very good. They've spent a lot of time making that very good. Um, so it's, you know, it, like anything, there's a bit of a frame or a bit of a learning curve there, and especially if you're coming into it, never have done, never having done any kind of single page application stuff, not only are you getting over the hump of the learning curve for Ember, you're just getting over the hump of what the hell is a single page application and how is that different than sprinkling jQuery into an existing page? Um, and there are a lot of big differences there that really are more inherent to single page applications than they are to Ember, but a lot of people their first time to run into those things is in the context of Ember, so it's easy to see those as, oh man, Ember is so hard, but half of what makes it hard is just being a new context and a new paradigm that you're not used to working with. It's worth, it's worth the climb. Sorry? Yeah, it's, I would definitely say it's worth the climb. It's, it's been very worth it to me just in terms of being able to spin up new applications very quickly. Um, and really one of the best things that I like about Ember is that it is so opinionated. Uh, just like Rails is very opinionated about, you know, oh, that kind of code doesn't belong in your controller. That should be happening at the model level or wherever. Ember has a lot of those same kind of opinions and really gives you a good framework and scaffold structure to start from. And one of the things that I think is really beneficial about that is much like with Rails, if you have a sanely you know, if you've been maintaining your Rails application sanely and doing things mostly the Rails way, any Rails developer in the world can come in and look at it and very quickly be up to speed with what's going on here, how does all this work, uh, and Ember is very much the same way. If you follow the Ember defaults and do things the Ember way, any Ember developer is going to be able to come in and look at it and say, oh, okay, this makes sense. Everything lives where I expect it to live. Um, and so that, that kind of reduction of friction, to me, makes it very much worth it. Okay, so let's say you've got a Ember front end, a Rails back end. Uh, are there clear conventions or techniques for handling the authentication to that back end? Are there, is this like a solved problem? Uh, like, like, let's say your back end is got, you know, it's not an office. Yep. So the question is, if you have a Rails backend and an Ember frontend, is there a, a clear solved story for handling authentication between the two? Um, there are a couple of different ways that you can do it. Um, there's a relatively new uh, Ember add-on called, I believe, Tori, T-O-R-R-I-I, that uh, is basically OAuth for Ember. Um, so that, I haven't used it, so I can't really vouch for it, but it seems to be very good, and it's from some of the people that are Ember core team members. So I expect that the quality on that's gonna be pretty high. Um, outside of that, there's not like a, a firm standard. I mean, I've, a lot of people are doing it, and you know, depending on, part of it comes down to how are you deploying these things, and you know, if your Ember front end is part of your Rails app and lives there, then you can have a lot of benefits of, oh, just redirect to a normal auth flow, get them through that, and then redirect them back to the Ember app, and things just work like you expect them to. Um, so kind of, I guess, is the answer to your question. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> That's all right. I think we're probably about out of time anyway. Yeah, we're we're a little bit over. So, thanks everybody.